being willing to, just so everyone knows, this is an hour long session, so it actually goes all the way until 10, 10, 10, sometime like that. Most of the sessions are half an hour, so if you desperately need to go to a session at 9.30, uh, if you just sit on the outside so you can leave without totally disrupting, that But thank you so much for wanting to come to an hour long one. I'm very excited. We've got a lot to talk about. All right, so we can get started. Um, as Sam said, thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Casey Davis Kaufman. I'm the Associate Director of the WGBH Media Library and Archives and Project Manager for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. And today we're going to talk about our Mellon funded project to build on Hyrax and Avalon for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. So first we'll give you a little bit of background on the American Archive of Public Broadcasting in case you're not familiar with it. Um, we'll talk about our plans for our migration of our current repository to our Hyrax repository. We'll give a, a bit of an overview of P the PB Core metadata schema. We'll talk about um, the advantages of Hyrax that we have seen through our project and talk about some of our challenges and our plans for the future. So briefly, um, the American Archive of Public Broadcasting is a collaboration between the Library of Congress and WGBH. Um, our mission is broad. We are seeking to preserve as much as possible uh, significant historical content created by public television and radio stations across the country and make it accessible as much as possible, again, to the American public. Um, it was instituted in 2009 by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and in 2013 uh, CPB selected the library and WGBH to be the permanent stewards. So to date, we have digitized more than 50,000 hours of public television and radio content from over 100 stations representing over 300 creators across the country. Our website um, is a black red application with a solar index that launched um, in October 2015. We've made available online um, to anyone in the United States for research, educational, and informational purposes over 35,000 of the digital um, video and audio files that we've digitized, about 39% of the collection and growing. Um, we provide public access to the entire collection, which currently represents about 90,000 digital objects. Um, on location at the Library of Congress and at WGBH. So if you physically come to GBH or the library, you have access through our, um, through our, our web portal um, to the entire collection. And users can also search the more than 2.5 million inventory records that have also been created by the stations across the country um, for uh, material that hasn't been digitized yet. So um, we share governance responsibilities with the Library of Congress um, on policy, collection development, um, ingest, and making policies around access related to copyright law. Um, and uh, the Library of Congress is responsible for the long-term preservation of the collection, while WGBH is responsible for access to the collection, so our, uh, managing our website, our archival management system, or AMS, which uh, our team's going to talk more about in a minute and outreach to creators and to uh, users of the collection. So um, not only do I see this as a collaboration between the Library of Congress and WGBH, but we're also collaborating with these creators across the country who have been willing to participate in this national effort to preserve their content at the Library of Congress and make it available to a national audience again. Um, much of the content in the archive is very local content that was never seen outside of the local community. So now brought together, it really creates a wonderful <coughs> tapestry of our late 20th century cultural heritage as documented by public television and radio. Um, and people are, you're able to see you know, uh, how public television stations in, say, Mississippi cover topics that um, were you know, national, nationally rec uh, national topics all around the country. So you're able to kind of compare and contrast how um, lo localities um, you know, responded to issues across the country over the last say, 70 plus years. I did want to say that um, some of our collaborators are universities, university special collections that have <coughs> preserved um, public television and radio material from their own um, communities. So for example, the Hoover, uh, the Hoover Institution at Stanford, University of Houston, um, University of Maryland, and yeah, IU also, and oh yeah, Washington University in St. Louis. So if you have public television and radio material in your collection that has or has not yet been digitized, let us know. We'd love to work with you. Um, we have several different ways that you can participate. You could um, look at us as kind of a second uh, preservation repository. 
to preserve copies at the Library of Congress, and we can also make them available to you know, the extent that we can on our website, or we can take your metadata and provide direct links to your digital objects in your own repositories. Um, so our goals are lofty. We're seeking to coordinate a national effort to preserve public television and radio before it is lost. As you know, we are in a race against time to preserve magnetic media. Um, we want to be a focal point uh, for discoverability of content, either that we have preserved in our collection and made available on our own website, or providing direct links as a portal to other content um, hosted by other institutions. We're providing standards and best practices to the public media community around preservation and also um, to the archival community about how we've made large um, audiovisual collections available online. And um, we want to facilitate the use of AV um, public media content for scholars, educators, researchers, and the general public and um, increase public awareness of the significance of historic public media as a cultural record that needs to be preserved. So we are committed to growing the collection by up to 25,000 hours of digitized or born digital content every year. This year we've really focused on um, focusing on underrepresented states and communities in the archive, so we're currently lacking any content from about 12 states and um, some of the U.S. Ter territories. Um, we've provided grant writing assistance to organizations um, to help them submit proposals to get their stuff digitized. Um, so these are some of the other value of AAPB participation that we, um, that we share with stations, that we're preserving copies at the Library of Congress, um, that we're managing an access platform that they don't have to manage. Um, that their collection becomes part of a broader national initiative, that we're providing guidance and fundraising assistance and um, digitization project management support. And um, they also, their materials that are added to the archive get to be part of some of our other, um, our research like transcript creation. Um, we've been working um, to uh, create uh, automated transcripts of the entire collection using speech text software. Um, crowdsourcing initiatives, and we're starting to work with computational linguists around automating some metadata creation. And finally, um, I'm going to about to hand it over to our team to talk about um, how um, organizations that are involved in the AAPB have access to our archival management system, or our AMS, where they can search, manage, update, and access their records, and where our team, our, um, our uh, archivist team, also manages our collection. So I'm going to hand it over to Sadie to talk about that. Hey guys, I'm Sadie Rosa. Um, make sure, yes. So this is our current archival management system. It is um, in use right now, and um, where we do all of our work. Um, and it is a kind of custom built application that AVP built um, before WGBH even take, took over the project, and before the project was really in anything beyond its infancy. So it was mainly designed to manage 2.5 million inventory records and digitization of 68,000 of those items and track that kind of through. So I'll kind of talk about that as we go, um, how our needs have changed a little bit and why we are switching to a new repository. Okay, so before we get started and dive, or dive deeper, I wanted to just highlight some of the more unique features of the AMS that not everyone's repositories deal with. Um, for us, we don't actually manage the files, we don't ingest the files into the system. It is a purely metadata repository, that's all we are storing there. Um, we do store an identifier on the metadata records that links to where we store our uh, media, uh, and then it is accessible like through that link. Um, but we don't actually use the system to manage any of that in terms of an ingest or transcoding or any kind of thing um, through the system. Uh, the AMS is very hierarchical and it's based on the PB core data model, which I'll go into a little bit more later. Um, and uh, it includes a lot of batch operations. I think a lot of people's repositories that, uh, rely on that, but ours is really important for us to do that because we're working with so many different stations that are delivering content in so many different ways, sometimes like spreadsheets they just made up and we gave them a template, but sometimes they have, you know, a database that already exists and they're exporting it into whatever uh, way uh, is easiest for them and then we kind of do the massaging after they give us that. Um, and then just to highlight, I think Casey kind of, uh, mostly uh, covered this, but um, this system isn't for the general public to access the content. We have AmericanArchive.org for that. It's a lightweight read-only application. Um, Whereas uh, 
this is where we do all of our editing and uh, metadata enhancement and creation. So, so how, when we realized that our project was changing and the needs were changing, we uh, decided there were probably three ways we could go forward. Uh, we could build on the current AMS, and I'll go into why we didn't choose that um, and why um, kind of the, the differences and how they were so kind of structurally part of the way the repos original repository was built that we needed to change. So we just decided it's probably better to go with something else. We thought for a little bit about building a new system from scratch, but that seemed pretty silly when we had already had experience working um, with standard based applications um, for other projects. Um, so we explored looking at um, Avalon at the time and Hyrax at the time, um, which was 1.0 and Avalon 6, I believe. And we made this gigantic spreadsheet. It had all of our updated system requirements and then a column for like what everything could do. And we compared them and we, walked, we worked with Mike Giarlo, we worked with the Avalon team. Um, and after that gap analysis, we decided that um, both for what the systems already gave us and the kind of promises we had in the future based on the systems, that a Sambara based solution would be best. So, the changes we're making between the current AMS and our updated one. Um, the first thing is changing the way we're using the PB Core data model. So, I'll go into this in more detail, but I'll, just so you kind of have the idea of it now, PB Core has basically an asset level thing at the top which describes just the intellectual content. It doesn't describe how it's, ca um, how it's captured in any format. And then under it, it can have as many child um, or nested um, instantiations as it wants, which could have, you know, a tape, it could have five tapes, it could have the master tape and a dub and a viewing copy and everything like that. And it can also have the digital files there. The current AMS was set up very much based on physical inventory, so there was really only one physical asset per record. Um, and it was set up on the idea of this is an institution, they hold this copy of this thing, and then we are digitizing it. So all the digital files that um, are made are also nested under that same original asset record. And that worked really well. It kept brought the master, the, you know, the preservation master, the mezzanine, the proxy, all of that was stored within, and we had a very nice layout for seeing, you know, the asset and then all the children nested on the side. But we have switched a little bit from being a very inventory based thing to being not totally but slightly more like union catalog-y um, and more like a little bit more like WorldCat almost in the sense that we now are realizing there's some <coughs> titles that are especially more historic titles um, such as the ones that were distributed by National Educational Television which is the predecessor to PBS and was very distributed across the entire country. There are copies of that in a lot of different repositories and it didn't make sense to have an organization for each of those who each had their own record for the tape where the content was the same across them. We wanted one record for that content and then to be able to have children uh, representing, okay, the Library of Congress has a copy of this, um, Indiana University has a copy of this, WGBH has a copy of this, and just one record and have it housed under that. And it was hard to imagine switching something where the real parent was the organization who owned the record um, to something where the asset itself is the parent and the only thing that the organization owns is their own copy of something. So it would be a really big change to the database structure that we had in our current system. Kind of didn't make sense. We, we were making it work. We were like fudging it a little bit, but it wasn't 100% um, working. So that was one of our biggest decisions, um, decision points. We also, um, the original system was built in 2013, 2014, and a lot of the plugins it was using weren't being supported anymore. Um, we didn't um, have very good options for updating those. Um, the biggest example is we were using Mint, which is like a data mapper, um, and Mint 1 is no longer supported, and we still use it. It still works, but you have to use it in Chrome right now. It won't be, it's not, you can't, we can't get anyone to use it in any other browsers. It won't work. So as we're seeing things kind of die away, we didn't have good options. Um, and then especially because um, we uh, liked kind of the maturity of Sambara, the fact that they're actively maintaining core components and really like putting the focus on that. Um, and then also having people to go to when something stops working or having people in our team that had expertise in how to continue to update that. Um, and that brings us to building a system that we can continue to develop as our needs changed. 
Um, like I said, this a current system was built when the project started. Our needs have changed a lot from just an inventory and just a, one massive digitization project. Um, it was also built by completely outside contractors, no GBH staff or larger Congress staff for that matter uh, contributed to it. And it was built in PHP, which none of our developers have any special knowledge of or are very um, much experience with. <laughs> um, and, um, and it's just like kind of not the direction the rest of our applications are going. Um, so the updated AMS gives us just generally, we're a more mature project. We see where we're going better. We have a lot of five years of experience working on this. Um, but then also, it'll be built in both a robust community that has its own expertise, and also um, <coughs> our developers already have a level of expertise and like familiarity with. So our initial plan, when we proposed this to Mellon, was to build on Avalon 6. Um, and we were gonna, it was gonna give us a lot of time to just focus on building kind of AAP, AAPB specific things on top of what Avalon was giving us, figure out how to represent PB core and the more hierarchical nature of that in Avalon. That was the original plan. Um, however, we had some hiccups. Um, by the time the project launched, um, and we sat down with uh, the Avalon team, who are our advisors, specifically the Avalon team at IU, are direct advisors on the project for us, um, and part of like the overall project team. Um, we they were already planning on moving to Hyrax for Avalon Seven, and we didn't want to be building on something that wasn't really the way we're really going forward. But we also couldn't wait until Avalon 7 came out and then just build on top of that, which was like kind of our original plan, was just like take Avalon, add some AAPB stuff, be done. Um, so we switched it up and now um, we're building on Hyrax. We're using some uh, Avalon components that you, um, are being broken out and we're actually, we're building some of our own components and then we're also um, working together with the Avalon team to build some of the components that we both need that don't exist yet. So that's pretty much what I just said. <laughs> um, um, and we go through kind of our decision between uh, you know what to bake into the application, what to pull out to components, um, how to work with the um, the team, uh, the two teams together. So just to acknowledge, this is the core team, the development team. Um, Drew and Jason are up here, um, and Adil is um, one of the, our other developer who. Um, is uh, a staff member of AVP um, and currently in Pakistan, so couldn't come to you with it. Um, and uh, Kara, also from AVP, is serving as our scrum master. And this is our current roadmap. Um, we, you can see at the end there, we get really ambitious and have a bunch, like pretty much a new milestone every sprint instead of every like big cycle. But mostly the reason we're saying we can do that and we're, we're hoping we can do that is because we've started on a lot of these at the same time and this is just our ending point. We're not necessarily only working on them up until this point. Um, I'll highlight, uh, we've pretty much already done the PV4 part and the like work type metadata structure part, which is what I'm going to go into next. And really the thing I feel like we are confident of enough about how it is to present on and not say, this is what we plan to do, but this is actually what we are doing. Um, the things that we are planning to do is more batch import and kind of editing also, um, and export and reporting. So, now I'm going to get it into the metadata part. Essentially, the biggest part thing that to understand is that a, there's this thing in PB Core, which is the main thing people use in PB Core as a description document. Like I said, it has an asset, it has instantiations which can you can have literally as many instantiations as you want. There's no limit. Um, they can be both physical and digital. Um, and then within an instantiation, you can have an essence track, or you would have multiple essence tracks, which would be like in an audio, like in a video recording, you might have a video track, several audio tracks, a subtitle track, a DBS track. You would have those, and each one um, might have specific things that you would want to record about it. So you break those out also into uh, child like hierarchical components. So we decided. Even though really it makes sense that all of these would be kind of like one work, that each PB core hierarchical component would be its own work type in Hyrax. So we aren't using file sets for things like a digital instantiation because we want to add a lot of extra metadata. And on file sets, you don't really get to add your, you know, you don't really get to have a metadata profile. You don't get to add what you want. 
Um, so the biggest thing to take away is that this whole thing of one PD core description document does not equal one work type. Um, it equals, it can equal a lot of work types, but um, the asset is where we keep the in, um, intellectual content information, and then the biggest one that people, <laughs> we, 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 we talked a lot about this before we decided to go forward with it, but um, is this idea of a contribution. Um, it's not typically how you would want to model this, but it is, especially because it's, we're modeling it in RDF, um, it was pretty much the only way we could get this. Um, we went through a couple things, but basically, <coughs> We have people, in a broadcast context especially, people serve like lots of roles. You see those rolls of credits at the end of a movie. There are lots of things people do on just one program or one um, episode or film or even an interview, like a raw footage. Um, and so first approach, we thought maybe we would just have a predicate for every single role. Like has producer, has director, has editor, has PA, has blah, 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 has blah, 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 blah. We probably have like 200 of those and we'd have to keep adding them as we got new content that had different roles. That seemed maybe manageable. We weren't entirely sure <laughs> how we would do that. But then we realized that's not even good enough because we have this other information that's already in our PB Core XML, which is like how we're, we have our data now, um, which could be uh, the affiliation of the person, um, or the, and it's specifically that's usually the affiliation of the person that makes them relevant to this work. So you know, a person could have a lot of affiliations, but they're being interviewed about their job at this one place, or because they're a staff member at this university where this thing is hosted, or whatever. But then also for things where people are uh, actually for dramas and things where people are acting as roles, you not only need your role, which is actor, but you need your portrayal, which is like I'm playing Peter Pan in this. Um, and so that's too much stuff to do in one triple from the Fedora object. So from our asset, we couldn't say is produce no is actor ha and has role because the person that you're saying is the actor isn't always playing Peter Pan, right? They're not always playing Peter Pan. They're just doing it in this one context. So we had to bundle that together into one work type. Um, I can talk more about this if anyone has specific questions. This uh, thing we, it took us a while to come to this. And when I explained it to some people, they looked at us like we were a little bit crazy. But I think this is the um, way we're doing it. And I'm gonna explain how we make it work with our cataloging workflows so it's not really hard for the cataloger. So to get into that, um, we have a pretty simple cataloging workflow. We tried to limit the number of clicks, considering how hierarchical the data is and how many different forms you're working with. We tried to limit the number. So one thing we did is we have just a general edit form for the asset. Um, and the user has to come in through an asset, either creating a new asset or getting to an asset page and adding a child. We don't want instantiations that don't have an asset. We don't allow, we, technically you could do it, but you would, there's no way in the UI to get to that point. Because um, we want everything to have that context. But then, rather than saying, okay, I saved this asset, I get to the asset page, then I click attach child, and then I go to it, we decided it would be easier if you just had a button like this to say, okay, save this, but I don't want to go to the asset page yet. I don't want to see that. I want to go directly to the child I know I want to make. So then you're just, it's just two left, it's like one or two less clicks. Um, and then we also, for that contributor, that like contribution thing, we thought it would be really ridiculous to make people go to an entirely different edit form to enter between two and four small values and probably have to do that between five and 50 times per asset. That just seemed a lot of clicking and a lot of like opportunity to kind of lose your context and not remember exactly what the asset that you're adding things to is. So we actually embedded the edit form for the uh, child contributions into the asset edit form itself. So there's this little drop down section of credits um, and you can keep adding them. And then when you hit save, it saves the asset and then it saves every single child that you've added here. And it works the same way when you're editing. They're just embedded in there. And it makes it way easier for the cataloger. Uh, we also decided to do that for our asset show pages, like the, the um, show pages. So you can't see it super well, but there's the regular asset details, and then we have these subsections for any um, smaller, like nested child stuff. And then we updated the kind of like items and child things to specifically be instantiations, and updated like what data you see, so there's a little more context as a um, 
browser as someone who's like, yes, I care about the master of this. Tell me about that. You can see it there. And then I think I'm getting close to the end. Oh, yeah. The one of the last things we did, like I said, we wanted very much this asset centric thing. We know we were modeling where there's a bunch of different work types. Uh, but we didn't necessarily want users coming across just a physical instantiation and not knowing what it's a physical instantiation of, right? So you know it's a three-quarter inch tape, you know it has this duration, you know it's this, it's a master or it's a dub or it's a whatever, you know it's in English, but you don't know what's the title, the description, all the like, intellectual content information about it. So we limited the search results to only asset searches, um, so only assets come up. So that way, when you're finding any of the child works, you're always doing it through the context of the asset. Um, we then realized we do need some um, searching based on the child works. Sometimes you're going to want to say, give me everything that is on this format, or give me everything that is sound, versus give me everything that is moving image, or things like that. So in Solar, we index the child onto the asset, uh, onto the like, parent work. That way we can still search them and we can use the facets. So we have these facets, like the holding institution or the physical format or the media type. And what you will get in those search results isn't the physical instantiation in the results. It'll be the assets that have physical instantiations or other instantiations that that's true for. And you click on this, you get to the asset view page where you can see not only that's not what I wanted. Um, where you can see not only the data for the context, but you can say like, oh yeah, this came up because it's on a thing that's on three quarter inch. So that's kind of even though we have a very wide ranging data model with lots of work types, very much controlling the way the user um, experiences it, so they always have context for that. And then lastly, we're thinking about how we're going um, to continue to uh, change our data model, but mainly in the sense of broadcast stuff has a lot of series, right? So you have an episode and you have a series and it has like 50 episodes. We want an asset record for every single one of those episodes because it has a different description, a different broadcast date, whatever. Currently in the AMS and currently actually in our new AMS, we model all of this, all the series data gets put on that asset. So for an episode, it also has a title that is the series title and a description that is a series description. And that's really right now for ease of migration and also ease of what we're like eventually gonna do with import where you have, we don't want duplicate series being added every time that someone spells the series wrong, uh, slightly differently. But we're exploring the idea of a custom collection type for group bringing all those episodes together as a series. Uh, we just haven't gotten that far, so basically we're doing like phase one, and then eventually we know we're gonna wanna look at phase two of that. So that's how we're doing the data model right now, and that is the, the main part that we're like totally sure of we've done, um, it's implemented in our um, testing environment. And so I'm not going to go into other future plans. We're going to now kind of go back and look at how the experience has been so far building on Hyrax, starting with the advantages we've had working with Eric. Jason? Hello. So I'm Jason Korn. I'm one of the developers on the project. And yeah, I'm going to talk about the advantages. So the nice thing about working with Hyrax is that you get kind of a base platform to work from, right? Like you're not starting from scratch, um, which was you know one of the options that we were looking at uh, earlier in the project, going going rogue and just doing our own thing. Uh, this actually gave us you know something to, to work from and something that we as developers had had experience in. Um, so some of the you know some of the advantages of what you get out of the box are that automatic code generation. You get <coughs> you get the framework itself, right? Um, it's a lot easier to work with a framework than to create a framework. Um, the other thing uh, you get is the styling, uh, which you know, is, is looking pretty good lately. And for me, the way I always kind of describe it, I mean, it's Bootstrap. <coughs> and when whenever I describe Bootstrap, it's kind of like I think of it as like raising the floor of design, especially as a developer myself. <laughs> Lots and lots of times people come to you and be like, hey, like design this thing too, right? 
and I'm not a designer, right? But the thing that Bootstrap gives me is that my design can only get so bad, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like there's like the, the 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 floor has been raised, like it's going to be usable, right? <laughs> um, the other thing that we really, really liked about it is the flip flop functionality that came with IRX. Um, that seems it's it's really cool in that it doesn't like you can take it for granted, <laughs> right? Like here's the stuff that like like we're not even thinking about it as developers because it's just turned on or turned off within the system itself. Um, so I was looking at you know some of what we're using on flip flop functionality, and I'm like, oh sweet, yeah, this is like all stuff that we didn't have to code ourselves. Um, so that was a huge advantage. Um, the other thing you get out of the out of the box with Hyrax is your configurable work types. Um, you saw, you know, we had a bunch of different we had a few different models that we're using, um, and it just it made it easier to create the instances of those models and define the relationships between them. Um, the other thing we really liked about it was the, the collection types. Um, and as Sadie said, we're kind of looking at looking at those uh, for a future iteration to kind of see if we can use those to solve some more of our data modeling challenges. Um, um, oh, and the and uh, you know the other stuff that we get out of there is you know the file upload, the checkbox, the deposit agreement. Um, it's just kind of all there and ready to roll for us. Um, the other huge advantage we've seen, just not even on this project, but on pretty much everything we work with in the, within the community, is the high ranks community itself. Um, it's it's rare to, to find a community in which you can just go and find the person who actually developed the thing and be like, what is it about this? You know, ask them the question about that thing to be like, you know, how am I supposed to be using this? Uh, does it make sense to use it in this way? Um, do you have any other ideas? Um, and the fact that you can just go on the Slack channel and be like, oh, hey, so and so, like, what do you think about this? And like, you'll get a response, like, almost immediately. Um, you know, unless somebody's on vacation or something. Right? Like, it's just everybody is so active and so engaged and so willing to to help out, help each other out um, that that community is is. Probably the big, I would say the biggest, big, biggest advantage of working within Hyrax and Sanvera. Um, the other thing we've noticed um, is that we've had, I think it's one or two um, commits that we put back into the community. It was stuff that we found when we were working within Hyrax, and we we're like, okay, well, like this is not just useful for us. So like, let's not just do it on our own application. Let's put it into Hyrax core, or let's you know see if it's the. the, the potentially used for Hyrax core. Um, and those PRs reviewed really quickly, uh, got into Hyrax core, and you know, next time we did our, we, we've been doing periodic upgrades, and next upgrade had those changes in it, and it's not just us that will use it, it's gonna be everybody else too. Uh, and uh, Tom was talking about some of this yesterday, which uh, made me excited, because it was just like, some of the exact same points that I was going to make today, um, which is that Hyrax is definitely becoming, it seems to be, be becoming a much more stable product. Um, the, the easier, faster upgrades, like we've been staying on top of it. Uh, we started in 2.0, and I think we're all the way up to date, or we might be one release behind. But each of those upgrades has been uh, quick and easy and fast. Um, we've been able to, it's, it's made it easier to contribute back to the, uh, we've been able to contribute back faster, which then that code gets back into our application faster, and that just makes, it just makes everything run really smoothly. Um, the other thing that I've liked is like, I've been, I didn't, I didn't get involved too much, but I liked all the, the Semper discussion that was going on on Slack and then in person and stuff. Like, I think that's a, another sign of maturity that we're like, Thinking about that level of, of, you know, what is the promise of semantic versioning, and what is, you know, what do, what do we owe ourselves as a community as far as that promise goes? Um, and I think with the with the 
the smaller or faster upgrades. It's also making it easier. Um, like there's nobody that makes it makes it so that like nobody sprints ahead by a huge chunk while leaving the, like other institutions behind. If you have that easy upgrade path, it's just like you just have to do you know a couple small things and then you're uh, up to date. So those have all been uh, great advantages of working within Hyrax. Um, so now I'm going to pass it to Drew to talk about some of the challenges <coughs> that that also entails. Hello. So yeah, this is the, uh, the whining part of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> if you just came in, I assure you there was a whole presentation that was really positive right before this. How are you advancing this? Okay, great. Yeah, so, um, you know, in light of all of those advantages, uh, there are obviously some challenges, as there always are. Um, and a lot of them are probably familiar to some of you. Um, uh, Trying to build on shifting sands, I think, is, is one. Like, uh, you don't want the product that you're using to be stagnant, right? You want the bugs to be fixed and features to be developed and all that stuff. Um, but it's also, it takes a lot of time to, to build on it, and so you have to kind of decide when you want to jump in and when you want to wait for other things. And the answer to that is just highly varying. I mean, it depends on the circumstance, it depends on what feature, it depends on what the gain is, the value add uh, for waiting on that thing. So in our case, we had uh, some Avalon uh, components that, um, like the media player that we're going to incorporate, um, that I, I don't think we're waiting on that, right? We're going to go ahead and do that. No, we were waiting on it. We decided to push back me any t discussion of media display until that was ready. Right. So that's a good point, because that really informed our development uh, roadmap. Uh, uh, the features that we decided to work on early on were different than the uh, features that we wanted to wait on. Um, and it all just kind of has to fit together because obviously some features depend on other features, right? So there's an inherent hierarchy in, in which, uh, right, an inherent order in which you have to do this sometimes. But uh, yeah, so the media player is what we're actually starting to develop now. We're going to be starting to incorporate that now. Also, um, a generic batch import solution. We've been uh, jamming on that. And those discussions have been interesting because <laughs> we've come at it from uh, to kind of different uh, different angles, and we've uh, found some middle ground, so we're actually getting some code uh, in GitHub, which is which is nice. Um, if you are familiar with Haiku, I believe, right? Isn't that where? Yeah, we're stealing some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Haiku. So Haiku is the Hydra in a Box project. It became Haiku. It's like a hosted uh, Hyrax solution. There's a product at Northwestern called Donut, which ripped out their um, batch import solution. And we really liked some of the features that they had, uh, but it's very opinionated, Donut is. It's very tailored to uh, their system. So I should say it's the Donut import. Uh, I think Donut's a much bigger system, but it has an import feature. So we are taking a lot of pages from that, but also trying to make it more. Um, but those are some examples of things that we decided to wait on uh, because of logistics and stuff like that. Uh, co uh, contributions back. Um, to the, to the core that other people can use. This is another kind of, uh, not so much a coding decision or a, a programmatic decision, but like a, a policy. Uh, contributing back always takes more time than just writing it yourself, <laughs> right? So if you really want to participate and be a good community member by contributing something back, you have to understand that that's probably gonna take a little bit more time, not only to make the code uh, more generic for generic use, um, but you there's a cycle, there's a, there's a process, and, and uh, you have to make tests for it. You have to get feedback from other community members, and sometimes the community members will have you change things. And so it just it lengthens your development cycle. Uh, but the idea is that hopefully it doesn't lengthen it so much that it's not a valuable thing to be contributing back. And those are the types of uh, cost-benefit analyses that you have to, to make when you're doing that sort of thing. Uh, so we've contributed a, a handful of things back. Um, there are some bigger features that we might be able to contribute back, um, but again, that cost-benefit analysis, making it more generic for the broader community to use at this time just isn't quite worth it at this time. <laughs> and I can go into a couple of features like that if anyone is interested in some of the more details of what this might be. Um, documentation. <laughs> uh, I, have an, I have a unique role in the Sandberg community around documentation because I'm part of that effort, and it's, it's not very good. <laughs> in some places, excuse me, in some places it's not very good. Other places it's fantastic. Uh, 
And as Jason had mentioned, the community itself is a documentation source, you know, like institutional knowledge among people, which isn't ideal. You want to have it written down somewhere. You want to have it uh, in a nice tutorial that you can do a little walkthrough. But all of that takes time, and nobody ever has any time to do it. <laughs> so uh, lack of documentation has definitely been a challenge. Um, but as being a member and a somewhat driver of the documentation effort in the San Diego community, if this is a problem that everybody agrees with, and everybody should agree that it's a problem, uh, please see me about making it better from the documentation side of things. Oh, I didn't put a point there. I didn't realize that was there. Yeah, join my group if you can. I put oh. it there. I was plugging him. Yeah. Not, he wasn't <laughs> plugging himself. But. As I plugged himself. Okay. <laughs> uh, a, a big challenge that we had um, in developing an app that's built on top of Hyrex was testing. Um, Higher access is pretty well tested uh, as a gem. Uh, so the code base is, is pretty well tested. Now you want your application to be tested as well, right? But a lot of times what you're doing is you're enhancing other Hyrax uh, components or Hyraxisms, as I call them, like little little bits of the Hyrax code that you're customizing or extending in your own way. Um, and so you run into that question of like, do I write tests around this because it's already kind of been tested in Hyrax. And so isolating the thing that you need tested is a bit of a challenge. And sort of the lazy way to go about doing that is start with just high level tests, what we call integration specs. And that is um, literally you, <laughs> you run the application and then have like a fake user, like a um, headless browser, we call it, perform steps, you know, click buttons and fill in things and hit save and, and then run uh, expectations uh, on, the, on the result of that. Um, and that is a very effective and powerful way of doing tests to make sure that your application works as expected. However, it's also really slow, <laughs> and it's really error prone, and it's really hard to get it because you've, you're having to do things like, you know, tell the user to click on this button that's inside of this HTML element, and sometimes it just doesn't render that way, and so you have to, it's, it's been a real challenge to kind of figure out how much integration testing we lean on and how much we step back. And we, and we started out really leaning on a heavy. And it just was, uh, it would break, and we would have trouble figuring out where it broke. And it became a real uh, time suck for us. And so we kind of wheeled that back a little bit and really focused on testing code that's closer, that's, that's lower level, you know, doing more unit testing and stuff. The trade off there is that if all you're doing is unit testing, you're, you aren't getting that big. Uh, <laughs> you aren't kind of getting that overall thing. So if you're doing unit testing alone, or hopefully you're doing a good uh, array of both, but it takes a lot of time and, again, cost benefits. Uh, I'm not really reading the slides as I'm talking. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think I just, uh, there you go. You go. I got it. And the slides are up, so you can look at them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so fighting the framework is a, is a phrase that we uh, use with fair regularity. <laughs> um, because uh, you know, as much as a Hyrax application can give you out of the box, and as much of the things that it gives you uh, when you're doing things in what I call the happy path, like you're not trying to customize it too much, or you're not trying to do that much. Um, but when you try to work around it, when you try to make a small customization, and that small customization that logically, in your mind, you don't think it's going to take that long, actually takes a really long time. <laughs> those are really frustrating points. And we've had a handful of those uh, in our development. And sometimes we plow through it, and we have a bunch of code that does something that you wouldn't think it would need that much code to do. Um, and other times we just say, no, <laughs> we're going to figure out a different way to do it, because it requires too much code. Um, fortunately, that hasn't been as prevalent as it has been in the past, uh, pre-Hyrex. But, it, but it's still there. It's, it's definitely something that we bump into. Uh, the ticking time bomb point at the bottom, that's a little dramatic. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> what that refers to is uh, a lot of times with the way that Hyrax is built, some of the customizations that you have to do, um, they're not configuration changes. They're actual code changes. Um, if they were configuration changes, then it might be a little bit easier to keep up with uh, new releases that come out if those releases do things in a different way. Uh, if it's not a configuration change, if you're actually extending classes and modifying code and monkey patching and doing things like that, um, 
providing your own classes, for instance, that adhere to a specific interface, and if that interface changes, uh, then those are the pieces of code that are just going to break, um, uh, in some cases, on upgrades. And what the Hyrax community has been doing a much, much better job of um, is keeping their promises to their adopters. Um, and there's been a huge focus on that, and I applaud it very much. Um, but because of the way Hyrax is, and because of the way that Hyrax uh, expects you to be customizing it, it's really a, a monumental challenge to kind of uh, accommodate all of those circumstances. Right? Um, a lot of times when we talk about semantic versioning, we talk about API changes. You know, did the API break? Well, in Hyrax, <laughs> it's very difficult to define what the API is when um, you're expecting your the, your adopters to customize whole classes or override methods and things like that. So is that part of the API? That is a question that I think is up in the air. I, for one, kind of think it is. Um, but it's also, if it is, then that makes <laughs> maintaining the API much, much harder. So uh, yeah, uh, all in all, uh, for those of you who came in right at the beginning of that wine fest, <laughs> uh, it's not all doom and gloom. It's, uh, but there are definitely challenges, and these are the things that uh, we hope to, hope to smooth out in the future. The future, yeah. yeah. See that? Yeah. Thanks. Nice, nice, nice. nice. uh, so just to wrap things up before we open it up for questions, I wanted to um, hit a few things in terms of both AAPB's future with AMS, and then um, also just our kind of future plans in terms of the application itself. So we are planning to continue development, and we had our slide with all of our milestones on it, and we're hoping to migrate um, February 2019. We're really lucky that we are building um, an ingest, a batch ingest, that will hopefully be able to take PB Core XML, and we currently have a system that very easily exports PB Core XML, so we're hoping the migration in terms of the data will be smoothish. <laughs> um, uh, and then, um, Kind of the whole point of this is that we will be able to continue to continue development because it is now a system we have a lot more intellectual and uh, just general control over um, and we we know how we're, we're getting more and more experience in terms of how to make the changes that we want to make within the system uh, we'll also be rolling this out to all of our contributing organizations like Casey said, we have over a hundred um, people who, not people, like organizations, multiple people at those organizations, um, who um, either can or hopefully will want to use this as the place where they uh, maintain their metadata, they update it, they have access to it. Um, so we'll not be making them migrate their data, we'll be doing that all as one thing. Uh, but we will be training them on new cataloging workflows and when um, for people either adding more data or new people to the project in general, um, we'll be um, rolling out our new import workflows. Um, and now that we're going to have something that is focused a little bit more on, um, we have a slightly better handle on how we want things to work for the um, contributing institutions and using this um, specifically as their system, we'll be actually promoting it a lot more. We originally tried to do that with our um, current system, but there were enough bugs and enough frustrations that at some point, like if they wanted to, they would, and we would help them do that, but we weren't really promoting it actively, and that's something we want to do more in the future. And um, then for the AMS application itself, um, we have recently um, been awarded G WGBH specifically, not the American Archive as a whole, um, a grant from NEH, and part of that um, will be to implement an instance of the AMS for WGBH specifically, um, for things that, like our entire collection, um, and for all of our staff to use internally, um, and then in that implementation also probably to further development, to, uh, to do some further development on it. Um, we're, like, we don't know how fast the community's gonna get to Hyrax with Valkyrie, but like definitely that's on our radar um, for that. We This is a five-year challenge grant, so maybe uh, we'll, we'll have to figure that out. Um, and um, some other features on that. Um, and then we're also planning on integrating it to some extent with um, the preservation metadata system that we built with IU on another NEH challenge, uh, another NEH grant, which is called FIDO, and specifically does preservation metadata and is geared right now towards AB, um, and trying to find some way for WGBH to use those two systems together to have both preservation and um, access and cataloging um, in a way that 
makes sense for our archivist to be able to have a control over the collection as a whole. Uh, so if you want to follow us on, um, and we'll be updating uh, you both on just the project in general, but um, as we roll out new technical changes, we um, often promote them, especially on our blog, which you can find at AmericanArchive.org. Um, that is where we kind of do our more long form um, things. Feel free to follow us. Um, and we just want to say thank you. And this is also my question slide, so I should also probably say that. Um, all of our email addresses are listed there if you need them. Um, I here for a tiny bit longer, right? Mm. Yeah, um, I am actually leaving after this presentation. I have a wedding to go to, so uh, if you, I won't be here the rest of the uh, conference. These guys will, so you can come up to them or email me at uh, Sadie underscore the at wgbh.org. But if you have any questions right now, happy to talk about them from any of us. Yeah, right. Oh, so you guys are thinking about rolling it out to the other. Oh, sorry. As you guys are thinking about rolling it out to the um, other potential users, are you thinking about Haiku then? Is that the point? Uh, no. So, huh? is it off? I think it's on. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're not actually thinking about Haiku. We are going to have one system, and we are going to manage that whole system. And within that, every organization will have an admin set that they are managers on, and they will just be able to basically use it as Kind of like, kind of like at a big institution, like a big institution, you might have a department, and that department has a certain control. That's kind of how we're looking at it more. Do you want to talk about triage? Oh, oh, yeah, and we're also going to use mediated deposit workflows um, in terms of like triaging new data in because we work with a lot of people who don't have metadata uh, people at their institution. So we'll, um, to a certain extent, allow them to you know do their own thing and like put their own metadata in it, but everything will have to go through an AVB staff person. Um, Currently, the ingest is tricky enough um, and that typically we kind of do that triage pre-putting it into the system at all. We get a lot of spreadsheets and we do the work, but we're hoping at this point to give them a little more control. They can really do the work, but we just have to check it before, before we're done. Any other questions? <laughs> So I'm, I'm working on a project that has a um, there's a different domain that has a similar um, use, you know, use case for this idea of um, nested um, sort of hierarchical objects of different types, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm, I'm interested in that uh, part of the um, uh, creation process that you've done in the form. So I was curious if the code for what you're working on is publicly accessible. If we could look at what you're yeah. Doing. Um, so I don't actually have the link to our GitHub, but I can share that in the Slack. It's a uh, GitHub uh, slash WGVH dash MLA slash AMS. Um, and we also have um, some Google Docs that go through our entire data model. Um, and the link for that is definitely on the poster I did yesterday, which is available as a PDF. I don't know, but we can share all of that. You can add it to the uh, slide with our social media. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll add that and update the slides, and the slides will be in, the slides are already in the presentation folder for Sandra at 2018. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Great, awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you.